number of old people per capita. This is going to look at the, uh, at the United States. The, uh, the, the, the pressure, the kind of fiscal pressure of aging in the United States is nothing as strong as it's going to be in, uh, in Spain or that it already is in uh, Japan. But we're going to look at the United States. So the old age dependency ratio, which is the fraction of people over 65 compared to the fraction of working age people, say, Often we use the 16, but we get the same kind of number if it's 20 to 65, uh, is increasing. And it's going to increase across the next uh, century. And people are worried about that. And we're going to show you not to worry too much. That's not the big problem we face. The big problem we face, but this paper is not going to be about, is how fast uh, health care costs are rising. Uh, but it's, it's not the problem, and it's not the problem for an interesting reason. The percentage of, of Americans with uh, university degrees is also rising. Now that, in principle, uh, makes aging even more drastic because uh, university-educated people uh, live longer than non-university uh, uh, educated people. It's something that health economists don't fully understand, but it's not a selection effect. Uh, I mean, I'm not an econometrician. I, I'm not sure how they've determined that, but they are sure it's not selection. It's something you pick up with education. You you're both live longer and you're healthier. You have less uh, severe health problems during the the life if you're university educated compared to non-university ed educated. Uh, and you're much more productive. And it turns out um, that's pretty much enough in the United States for compensating for uh, increased aging. Um, are, you, are you taking into account an increased time of work? Are you holding that? Like, no. No, no, no. That there's things we're going to do. Uh, we're going to have people just working up to 65 here. And the, the solution is going to be, we're going to put in, uh, uh, I'll mention this on the next slide. There's been a steady trend up until the, about 10 years ago. Now they're not so sure anymore. Uh, medical people and, uh, and uh, health economists, they call it compression of uh, morbidity. But what it means, if you're like 70 now, you're as healthy as a 60-year-old was uh, uh, 30 years ago. The bad news, and we're doing different simulations with that, that process seems to have stopped. Or there's fear that that has stopped. Yeah, we're going to live uh, much longer than our parents or grandparents, another 10 years on average, something like that. But it's not going to be maybe that our kids are going to live 10 years uh, more than us. Um, so we're going to have an overlapping generations model with, uh, in principle, a continuum, but uh, just lots and lots. We do this on the Minnesota uh, supercomputer. Uh, uh, lots of different ages, the, the agents who differ in all kinds of ways. And we're going to do uh, transition paths. And this is one reason when the guys from Harvard called me up because they needed some. They said there's no macroeconomist at Harvard who can build a model. And I guess I believe them. I mean, their colleagues are theirs. Uh, but I said, yeah, but this kind of model, you know who's an expert at building it? Because it was Juan Carlos and Dirk Kruger who did this the first time. Uh, we, we do transition paths. Up until Juan Carlos and, uh, and Dirk, everybody who had these really complicated overlapping generations models just did balanced growth paths. And uh, so Juan Carlos is, a, is an expert on this. Uh, but then, okay, I, I, look, I got like 45 minutes, but I got to tell stories. So what happened was we got this guy, Gajan uh, Ravindratran, who was a student. And then Juan Carlos said, you know, Tim, I used to think I was really good at computer programming. And this guy, Gajan, is just... So every generation's better. Even Kim over there at some point was better than me. 
But no, God. Than you. Now those guys are better than me. That's that's right. You're still better than me, but now the young guys are better than you. Uh, so that's an interesting phenomenon. That's this increased productivity we're talking about. Okay. So what we're going to do? We're going to start the model out in 1980. Uh, let it run, of course, for 30 years, and then we're going to compare what we get with the data. And since it kind of matches, I'm going to claim it matches, that gives us some confidence in the, in the projections. Uh, and then um, we're going to increase survival probabilities and number of college graduates from, uh, uh, for the next, whole next century. We, so that's going to get us the increased aging. Um, we've started, let me be honest about this, the, the results the final results of this aren't going to be as impressive as today uh, because we're going to put in lower fertility. In principle, there's no reason we have to keep lower fertility. Uh, in the United States, that's not that much of a problem. Of course, here in Southern Europe, it's a big problem. But you can solve that problem the way Americans do or have up until uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, let foreigners in. They not only come with little kids, their kids have more kids. The next generation not, but as long as you let some foreigners in, you can solve the fertility problem. And I already mentioned this comp uh, compression of morbidity. Uh, there's lots of people who work on it. Okay, so we're going to have this heterogeneity. I'll describe it to you uh, in a minute. The, the basic thing is when you're born, uh, and you even have, you get some assets, we do that, at this point we do it uniformly, distributing the uh, assets of the old guys who die uh, with the savings. Um, that's inheritance. Uh, we're going to put in heterogeneity there. Uh, Victor Rios thought that was important. I don't, it's not, but we're, we're going to put it in. Uh, so I'm going to describe that fixed um, exogeneity. The big thing is going to be education. The model is going to start when you're uh, 20 years old, and some of the people are still going to have to be going to school for the first five-year period. The period is going to be five years. Uh, but that's, pre that's determined before that. And it's not going to be endogenous. We're not going to have an endogenous schooling choice. We're just going to change that exogenously. The big random factors are going to be labor productivity shocks and health shocks. Yeah? Can you remind me what the question is exactly? No. Yes. Is how bad is aging going to be? At that level. At, on public finances. Capital accumul accumulation, all that. What are going to be the macroeconomic effects of aging? And we're going to show in this model, without the problems with fertility, aging's just not a problem at all. It's fully taken care of by having people be more college educated because they're going to be more productive and they're going to be healthier during their lifetimes. We're going to put in a government that collects labor taxes and provides Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and, uh, and we call it food stamps, but it's, this is going to, we have all kinds of micro data. Uh, unfortunately, some of these programs differ a lot by states in the United States, and we're going to do an extension where we have two states, not 50 plus the uh, District of Columbia, because some are high benefit states and some are low benefit states, at this point we're just going to do averages. But if, you're, if you have a big health shock, um, the government does something for you. The basic thing they do is they give you Medicaid, but if you but you got to be out of money then, and then they do they give you some other stuff too. Um, we can have different insurance options. Some people, and it matches the data, they're largely university educated, they're going to get uh, a tax break because the government's going to get their, uh, the government, the firm's going to get uh, their uh, insurance for them. But if they don't, they can get private insurance. 
we're going to have the private insurance be actuarially fair. That's probably, that doesn't match the data. Most uh, private insurance programs are rip-offs for one reason or another, but let's, let's worry about that. Future work with another five authors. Um, then firms hire their labor and capital. Here's the state. I'm going to show you just a couple. Go through it just to give you a feel what it, the dynamic programming problem for the consumer looks like. But the consumer has age that moves forward uh, period by period. You live up to 105. Uh, I mean, you probably die. We put in all the uh, death rates we see in the data. And we stretch, and then we're going to stretch that out. That's what aging is. Uh, but you can live up to a maximum of 105, although most people are dead by then. You've got education, which is fixed. You have health, which is random. You have labor productivity, shocks, which is random. There are uh, hump-shaped lifetime earnings profile, but you, got, you bounce around those. Uh, you have your private assets, and you have insurance that you chose the period before. I've already mentioned all this stuff. Uh, all the earnings from income taxes, which do not come out in one of these transfer programs, we're just going to throw into the ocean. That's not bad for an approximation. And because we have all the major transfer programs. Uh, Social Security includes uh, disability programs as well as old age programs. Uh, conditional survival probability depends on how old you are, what your health is, and uh, this education thing. We're not micro guys. We don't know why this is there, but this is a big thing in the literature. I mean, I guess it's good news for you guys. Having gone to university, even if you study like Latras, and can you believe, I mean, you'd think that's like a negative effect overall, but on average, you're going to live longer. And you're going to be healthier while you're living. It's just something in the data. Um, there's all kinds of things we put in. And we have micro data to calibrate a lot of this. How much of your health? You know, the, there's all this. That, well, they're running out of gas on this. But the Republicans are all against what they call Obamacare. But what's interesting is we have public health for old people. But old people have come to expect that. They say, I don't want government health care, but don't touch my Medicare. What the hell do you think's going on? And then we have, um, we have health plans for poor people. Uh, but what do I mean by poor? One thing is, if you're not poor enough, then you just have to run down all your savings. That can go pretty fast. And then they have a health care program for you. Like I say, there was a huge expansion of this, or I, like I said, what I was referring to, and uh, you Americans know this, there's a huge expansion of this under Obama, but kind of half the states expanded and half didn't. And so that's why we have to do that. Uh, probably have two states. Um, this varies a lot across states, but we just calibrate to the average what minimum consumption they'll do if you get really sick. Uh, is that a state-funded program? Yeah. Then how does it interact with your national budget? Federal budget? We kind of stick it in. Okay. No, that, yeah, yeah, there's lots of things. We're sticking, we're adding uh, state taxes. And we know they're different across states, but we're taking the average and sticking it in. Then we're taking the different state programs. Some states are, like we know, Minnesota is much better than... You're consolidating the state and federal government. Exactly. For this stuff. For this stuff. For everything involving income taxes and uh, payroll taxes and the transfers. And they, they differ a lot across states. 
I mean, I don't, depends on your perspective, but like, you know, in Minnesota, we have a lot of this stuff, and in Alabama, they have nothing, but anyway. But I think the federal government provides some funding to the states for food stamps and stuff. Yeah, but, and they, did, they provided funding to states to expand Medicaid, Medicaid which is administered <laughs> in the states, but some Republican government, governors refused to take it. The increased uh, transfers. They said, no, we don't believe in government health care. I don't know. But some guys like that guy Kasich he, in Ohio, who's a Republican, he said, no, of course I'm taking it. You're crazy not to take it. Anyway, this is not about, why am I just telling stories instead of doing the model? Uh, okay, and then medical eligibility. When do you get things like uh, Medicaid? You got to be really poor and have spent all your assets. Uh, and then, um, this is what, of course, Obamacare uh, was trying to do. This, we don't have Obamacare here. Uh, but uh, all, all the kind of insurance things you do are going to have perfect pooling and be actually fair. Consumers. Uh, Big choice consumer makes besides asset accumulation. You know, asset accumulation you always got to do, and that's what Juan Carlos and Dirk were doing uh, with uh, thinking about Social Security reform. Big thing they do is make ch uh, choices of switching uh, medical care or not having medical care at all. And of course, this is a big phenomenon in the United States where lots of young people somehow seem to rationally know the chances of them being ill next period are pretty small. They say, I'm going to risk it. I'm not going to pay for any health care. And then if I get sick, well, you know, I'm trying to save for buy a house. I guess I'll lose all that money. And, uh, but I'll get, uh, I'll get Medicaid. They'll give me whatever I need to uh, keep living. We're not going to have different levels of health care in this. You're going you're to get the same level of health care. Um, and David Canning, who's the kind of boss of this project, says that's not bad because rich people, they spend a lot more on their health care. There's very little evidence that it helps you. Sometimes it hurts you because they give you operations you don't need. No, that's what a big the, problem. What is the VI of S and VF of S? Yes. Network? Whether you're going to... Uh, in the next slide, you have... Yes, to yes. It's going to be, uh, if you are going to risk it, that's with the F, or, uh, or if you're going to buy your own uh, private health care. Some people have the employer... Yeah, okay, so here it is. Uh, um, here's uh, buying your own health care. And, you know, of course... It uh, looks like a Bellman equation, because it is, uh, and it's got lots of stuff in it. Okay? Well, what does health do for you? Where does health show up somewhere? Not in utility. No. It? It's going to show up in how productive you are. So if I get sick, I can't work. That's right. And, and uh, there's a lot of debate about this, whether it really helps you, uh, except getting you to next period, whether it improves your future health. Lots of health economists think to first order it doesn't, but I don't want to, I, I take what the Harvard Medical School, the, the Health uh, School of Public Health say. So can you go into that in more detail? No. So you get no. Here's what happens. The big thing that happens besides them charging you for stuff and then you getting some kind of benefits over here the big thing they do is that uh, the health shock you're going to get has uh, an exogenous shock component that jumps around, but it also depends on your health. Where's that? It must be in Ada. No, it should be in. Where is it? There could be a problem here. I'm not going to worry. There's uncertainty over health. And, uh, and labor income, and health should show up in earnings. You have an ADA 
that there. Side. What's that side do? That's survival. That's survival. That's survival. Yeah. But it should show up there. Let's not worry about this. That, that this is... Aid is somehow connected to your, what you're spending on health care? No. Health. Your health shock. That's what I said. Uh, health care, you just need it to get to the next period. It doesn't make you any healthier than the, the exogenous uh, transition probability. Here, we don't have health state be uh, endogenous. endogenous. And then we do, you know, every, everybody has a value function at some point. Uh, I hope in the 21st century we keep growing like we did in the 21st century, we keep growing like we did in the 20th century. This we've detrended. So but the reason people get health care is all for insurance treatment. It's all, it's all for insurance? No, nobody, nobody gets healthier. That's, oh, that just comes from these. Uh, so you're, you're sure against your exogenous health shocks. Yeah, but if you don't have insurance, they give you, through Medicaid or Medicare, they give you the treatment. What they don't do is make you wipe out your assets. Yeah, so yeah. it's insurance. Oh, yeah, it's just insurance. Oh, yeah. No, no, exactly. It's insurance. It's income insurance. It's asset in insurance. Right. It doesn't... You go to a fancy doctor, he's not going to help you. I mean, yeah, he probably in the United States, as you know, he'll probably set up an operation. We don't have this in there that you don't need, and your probability of death is going to go down because of the... It's like, oh. okay. Our dad, who died last year, he had prostate cancer. Most old men have prostate cancer. In the United States, they don't operate for, on that anymore. Because chances of you dying of the operation are much higher than, uh, than wh what it helps you. But in the U.S., they like to do operations like that because they get to charge. Anyway, the, i got to get back to this. Okay. So lots of the work was looking through micro data sets to figure out some of these parameters. These are not so complicated. These are like macro parameters. Uh, lifespan, like I say, it translates into uh, 20 to 105. Uh, tells you you can start getting, uh, you can retire at 65. We should be moving that out to 70 at some point. Uh, population growth rate, we're going to keep fixed. Um, these are all five-year parameters over there, but we translate into one-year parameters here. Uh, and we hope we're going to keep growing at 2%. Um, we're going to have some form of indivisible labor. Your labor endowment's one. You can work part-time, full-time, overtime, or zero. Okay? What's consumption share? A consumption share of what? Ah. This thing. That's the utility function. And it matters whether you work part-time or full-time, whether you get insurance? Is that Ah, uh, yeah, if, because if your income is high enough, you cannot go on uh, Medicaid. But that's not, I'm sorry, but when the, when the guy's making his choice whether to be a part-time or full-time guy, he knows if he's a full-time guy, he can get insurance, if he's a part-time guy, he can't get insurance? No, the right? opposite. The opposite. If he knows he's a part-time guy, he's going to have a low enough income that maybe he can get, if his uh, education level and so forth is low enough, then he can get Medicaid. The government will pay for his operation. Do you have employer provided health care? Yes. yes. First, no. Ah, yeah, and employer provided health care. And get health, can you get employer provided health care? If you have a stamp on your head, it says you're entitled to employ. We didn't work out the firm's problem and all the tax stuff. We just have the percentage of people who have an employer provided health care and even the bias of that towards university educated people, we put that in exogenously. But as soon as you're out of work, 
for five years, the next period no, you're not going to get it. Let me ask a linear question. Yeah. You go to work. Yeah. He asked if you go full time. Yeah. You get a certain probability of having an employer provide. You had it stamped on your head when you were born that you'll get it if you're working full time. And if you have, and if you work at the lowest amount and you yeah. stamped on your head, do you get it? No. And if you work the intermediate amount? No, the intermediate amount is full time. The high amount is you got an extra job or you're working and if overtime. You work low, you do not get it. That's right. That's all yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, and then we match all the income and uh, wealth distribution statistics for the United States using the controversial uh, Victor Rios trick. Do you guys all know that? There's a really high income state, uh, but that's it. That's the highest you can get. And then uh, if you get there, the only thing that can possibly happen is you stay there or go down. Once you're the richest you can be, you can't get richer. What does that mean? Really rich guys save like crazy. And that's how you get the upper 1% of the wealth distribution. It's a very controversial assumption. People now are moving beyond it. Victor's mad, but it has the benefit of being really simple to stick in the model to match uh, income and wealth uh, statistics. Okay. Yeah, where, where was that? That's in? Yeah. No, yeah, no, this, ah, this is, this thing you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, this is just, ah, that, that, to keep the number of states low at this point, we have uh, college educated guys get a bigger social security thing than, uh, than uh, non-college educated guys. And, 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 that, and that comes from the average, uh, yeah, that has the cap in it, everything like that. I mean, that's calibrated. That's a, that's a fact, but that's not how Social Security works. That, that actually depends on your earnings, your top five years of earnings, that caps out, all that. We don't put any of that in. It would require every individual has a different state variable, and we just didn't feel like doing it. Not, not, not feel like doing it, because we want our program to take a day to run on the supercomputer, not a week. So, we're going to put in that survival probabilities are just going to go up for everybody. Uh, I mean, they're normalized so that they're like one in today. And then we're just going to, we're going to keep them going up at the same average rate they went up before. And just to make things simple, uh, whatever expansion of life expectancies that we have uh, are going to cap out at uh, uh, the end of the century. Okay? Um, are you acting like the guys are living longer, the healthier, but right. somehow they force, they, can, they cannot work after 65? That's right. And we should. Uh, First run of the model. We're going to have a, we're, we're improving the model all the time. No, and the big thing is, of course, in the United States, we're going to we're starting already forcing people to work till 70. They're going to have to do that in Europe, and in France there'll be violence in the streets and stuff. Here they'll call a general strike, but nothing will happen. That's just how things work in Spain. But in some countries they're going to get mad that they have to work till 70. But I mean, we have to. Maybe even 75. Um, we're also going to put in the increase in, coll in college. That's US. Yeah, you know, I mean university education. Uh, so that we're going to be able to uh, capture this trend of increased, uh, observed increased trend in uh, university education. We're going to keep it up. And this is actually what it's going to imply, because we have this complicated overlapping generation structure. What is the percentage of university people in the population? 
It's going to rise from about 40% today to what, 60%. They're more productive and healthier. But you're going to, if there's some distribution of talent across the population. Right. And oh, no, we don't and, have and that. You deep, and you go deeply into the people who are in the margin weren't going. Right. You're acting like they're just as, as talented as the old people were. Yep. So in your model, you could have 100% of the people going to college, and then all of a sudden be geniuses all of a sudden. Yeah. Okay. Karen? That's why we're professors, to improve society. But is there data for that? Yes. That says that's true? No, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, productivity side, I don't know the data. The shocking thing is there is data, and some of these guys who do the regressions have done all their selection effects and everything. The fact that getting a university education on average makes you healthier is like a mystery, but that's in the data. And we're saying, hey, if it can make you healthier, it can make you smarter. And is there a real cost to sending people to college in your model? No. Do they not work? Or they, no, they, no, they work. The college educated guys work less the first five years. Okay, the other, but, but otherwise, there's no cost. Okay. And is that a choice or not? No. Okay. Uh, then this is the relative health uh, cost to health care. If we don't do this, things go wild. But, and, and I don't want to talk about this. When Juan Carlos was here, he probably spent a lot of time talking about it. It distracts us from what we want to do. Uh, Relative price of health care compared to consumption goods uh, has been going up like crazy, and we're going to have it stop going up after uh, 2020. Otherwise, that dominates all our results, and so we're just going to leave it out. That's what's scary. But, you know, here in Europe, health care is not rising as fast as in the United States. So, I mean, that, 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 that's another whole topic. Model validation. Um, here we wanted to see healthcare to GDP between 1980 and uh, 2010. Model versus data, fantastic. Uh, who chooses what? We used to have really bad pictures for this, now we kind of match it. Uh, this is uh, data, that's model. Results. What's that? What, what? What data is that? Oh. No, this is what health care you're under. Whether in equilibrium, the fraction of the population who's getting, who are poor enough that are getting Medicaid, this is it, Med Medicare, the old people stuff, private health insurance, um, other, I'm not remembering what, exactly what we stick in there. But wait, 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 like Medicaid. Yeah. The way your model can miss Medicaid is that the parameters you have to govern when you're eligible for it, ah. either your parameters are off, i.e. you're eligible in the world and you're not in the model, or your income that you have in the world must not equal to your model. Do you know where it's at? Yeah, I, the income distribution at a macro level, we match. We don't match it really perfectly by age, by not only, you know, how many people are in each come category, but where they are at age. It's age that's the term. How many 65-year-olds uh, are rich versus poor? How many 70-year-olds are rich per, per, versus poor? We don't match all those so moments. That in the background just showing up in these graphs. Yeah, but... We're, we think it looks pretty good. But you're also not matching year to year. Probably, what do you mean year to year? You're probably matching the distribution, the average distribution of wealth, but not the 1980. Oh, no, no, ex no, exactly. We match the average, di we match uh, income and wealth distributions in, uh, in, in 2010. In That's our calibration. In no, in 2010, or the year. distribution of wealth, 2010. Income distribution, wealth distribution is what it is in the United States. Growth between 1980 and 2010, we just take, a, we take total growth. We don't match health in uh, the income and wealth distribution exactly in, in 1980. Yeah, so, the, but, so then, 
this is fantastic that we're matching it this well. We, the model's doing it for us. Right, Kim? That's what I needed. Okay, I, I'm going to have to stop in a minute. Um, yeah, results. Uh, output per capita. Uh, this is all deflated by the 2% yearly trend. We're getting richer at 2%. That's just in uh, productivity gains. We detrend that, and in our model, we get even richer. But that's everybody going to college. If we didn't have the increased college, we'd actually get uh, poorer. So do you have a result about how many hours people don't work because they're sick in your model? Yes. More guys go to college where they can work more also. This is per capita. What about this is per capita. And there's two things driving it. No, you're 100% right, Kim. There's two things driving it. Uh, no, there's three things driving it, two in, two in a positive direction, one in a negative direction. The negative one is the increased number of people going to college. That means you have more old people because college people live longer. But you got two positive things. They're more productive when they're working and they take less time off for being sick because they're healthier. And they work less when they were young. They work less the first five years. Yes. You get 60% of the population are not working for five years when they were in their 20s. Uh, they work less. They work some. They work less. Okay. They work less. Right? Because usually you're done university when you're 22 or 23. It, it just. No, that's true. No, that's true. But, but you see, we're actually better. Aging's not bad. Um, God, what Juan Carlos probably showed you, but we took it out. We just don't want to talk about this. If we kept that going up, increased health care, we're all screwed. So, so just talking about that is too depressing, so I'm going to leave it out. But increased aging is not going to make us worse off. And go to Japan. They, they're not badly off. The politicians and... Uh, Journalists think it's bad that Japan has a low growth rate. They don't. Look at growth per working age person. In Japan over the last 20 years, 25 years, it's been as, just as good as the United States. It's 2%. You can, you can have a super old population and get by. And Japan has it. Spain is starting to have it. Exactly. We have increases in the capital stock, too. And a lot of that is people know they're going to be older, especially university age people. They realize they're going to live longer. And they save more. Uh, oh, yeah. See, Kim, this is taking some of it apart. It's uh, increased capital and increased uh, number of people working. And if we didn't have the college thing, uh, increased people are weighted by their productivity. So it I, seems like the, an interesting, another interesting counterfactual would be what if college is the same as it is up to like 2017 and then it and, stops. And then stops. Right? Because this is what if it stays the same as in 1980. No, well, that's we, right. We get at least that's time. right. Then I think that. Uh, You'd pick this up to here, and then you'd get the downward trend. Yeah, yeah. We're assuming that we're going to keep getting more and more people going to university, being healthier. And see, you're willing to believe me on that, because I just say some medical guys figured that out. And they're also more productive. And Patrick is dubious about that. We could, right. Say, you're going to be healthier, it's going to save us money on health care, so I'm going to give you a free college. And, and you're going to pay higher taxes because yeah. you're going to earn more money. Yeah, you so we'll, we'll send people and they can Try study, uh, they can study periodismo here in the, the Autonoma. Try that in Italy, it didn't work out so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>
we're not going to get into that. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe if you have a college education, you're a much more efficient taxi driver. <laughs> uh, okay, and then we put in the uh, compression of morbidity, and uh, um, that lowers uh, healthcare spending t too, because when you're 70, instead of being sick, you're only as sick as a 60-year-old, and it makes you better off. And that's even better. Main finding. Increased number of college ed, gradu, uh, graduates in uh, compression of morbidity is going to reduce the fiscal cost of aging. OK? Yes? I have a You're thinking that old people have the same consumption function as younger people. Yes. No, no. And that, that's right. Um, and there's some evidence that, 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 that's right. Lots of people save a whole lot so that they can have a good retirement and then they get to retired and they don't have energy to have fun anymore. No, it, no, and in our model, if you're sick, Marta, uh, if you're sick, that's going to affect your consumption be, uh, be, be, because you're going to be spending your money on health care rather than, uh, but if you're in good shape, you're going to have just as much fun at 80 as at, uh, at 60. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> OK. Yes, uh, Michael. Assuming the capital output ratio will be constant over the next 100 No. No. Instead, it's going to, we're going to have capital deepening. That's this picture. This is uh, capital per person. That's actually going to go up because the old people, the people are going to be saving more for retirement because they know they're living longer. That's one of the reasons that people are better, constantly better off, even more than the 2% exogenous growth rate. It's bad news for Spain, I think. It would be, see, now that we have this, the big effort here is to get a really good model. Once we have it, this is what, okay, very quick story. Why, why the heck am I doing this? When I was in Cambridge, England, one of my best friends was a guy named David Canning, who was a, a, a macroeconomist, game theorist. He has, look back, you can find papers by him in Econometrica like 30 years ago. Then he got out of academics to be a politician in Northern Ireland, because uh, he felt very uh, strongly about peace for Northern Ireland. He was a major person, even a candidate for uh, for uh, the parliament, the British uh, parliament, for this alliance party that was uh, uh, moderate Catholics and Protestants. And uh, then Bill Clinton and George Mitchell stepped in, negotiated with the extremists. Uh, he was out. The government's now a coalition of extremists from both sides, no moderate people. And he had to reinvent himself. He decided to become a health economist. Because that was, you know, he looked for where it was you know, easiest to get ahead. And now he's a, a chair professor, a catedratico, at the Harvard Health School. And he said, let me go back and do some macro. And he said, anybody in the uh, econ department at Harvard able to build a heterogeneous agent overlapping generations model? I said, no, we don't do that kind of stuff. You know, we run reduced form regressions or something. I don't know what they do at Harvard. Sorry. Uh, then he called me up and said, Tim, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to get my buddy Juan Carlos Conesa. We'll hire a lot of grad students, and we'll just start churning out papers. So, yeah, we'll put Spain in. No, but I mean, what worries me is that it seems like there are some countries where the composition of college versus non college is Oh, no, that, no, that's right. So then all these gains are kind of gone for this. No, that's right. If Spain is getting older faster <coughs> than uh, the United States and has less growth, growth of college graduates, it's going to be bad. That's unless that's unless that's the people exactly work exactly. longer, pay more taxes, getting more. older. If all you do when you get older is work more. Like you used to be 50, you're 
you're now 60. If you used to be working at 50, you're still working at 60, it should, should go out. That should no, squat. That's, that's what right. Saying. That's right. You've got to get that sorted out. Yes, that's right. But it's flattening out because it doesn't pay. Anyway, speaking of which, if all that happens, no college, you take people, they're going along, they live to, they live to 70, they used to die at 70, they work to 60, they have 10 years of retirement. You know, add 10. Well, you had 10 more years of work. Yeah. Same length of retirement. It's not going to do squat. That's true. That's all I keep saying. That's true. Okay. No, oh, have to do oh, but they also have to be healthier. But yeah. that's this compression or morbidity right. thing. That's right. If they're healthier. John Chauvin starts his talk with pictures of what 50 year olds looked like 40 years ago. That's right. Then they show you what 50 year olds look like now, and they look like 30 year olds. And it just. No, that's silver, right. And it's not going to do squat if you do it that way. <laughs> that's right. That's the sort of thing you should think about. That's right. Patrick just turned 60, <laughs> and he looks like he's. 45. 29. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right, let's take a five-minute break, and we'll get the second person up here.